we've seen time and time again is that when the total spend on global hydrocarbons reaches 7% of global GDP, the market crashes. So, you know, actually, although there are certain people that are gagging to push the price of oil up to $200, the reason being is that oil and gas are the easiest way to fleece people of their money after direct taxation. So you're paying one, one uh, euro 35 or whatever, one euro 40 at the pump for uh, gasoline. Over 80 cents of that is taxation. Now when you think that you're paying more in tax for every, on every litre of fuel you buy than you were actually paying for your fuel just nine years ago. And even with that increase in taxation, the economies are still in the proverbial buyer. Because that's the way it was set up. So the notional value here, notional value is considerably in excess of 85 billion euro. And it's Exxon that are holding the uh, licenses here. We have Spanish Point. Again, similar amount, similar distance off of the coast of Clare. 1.25 trillion cubic feet of natural gas. Um, nearly a quarter of a billion barrels of oil. It's a much smaller company, Providence. So, Therese went through this, I'm not going to go through this in great detail, but this is basically, this is basically a summary, and this is not complete, but this is a summary of the deal that Shell got when it was negotiating in Pokori. Uh, uh, the Nigerian government got a better deal than the Irish government. And it's really all thanks to this man. And he has reportedly admitted that he sold the tax and sanction to Shell. I would love to know what he means by sold. You know, I, mean, I don't need to tell you this guy's uh, resume, but um, I think it's been pretty well established that his corruption in public office goes back some you know, 35 years or so. And yet this is the guy that is put in charge of carbon carbon sales. Now, first of all, this is incredibly ignorant. It's arrogant and it's ignorant. There's a hell of a lot of people from Ireland who have spent their lives working in the hydrocarbons industry, including Peter Southern, but that's another story. I'm not suggesting for one moment that Peter Southern should have been engaged to represent the Irish government because he'd have probably given Shell a better deal than Ray Burke did. But you know, this is the time to acknowledge that there are, the Irish government and the Irish administration does not have the expertise to negotiate with the hydrocarbons industry. These guys have been doing what they do for nearly 100 years. They are very, very good at what they do. All of the senior executives are incentivized through stock options. It's deferred compensation. And those stock options, obviously, the value of those stock options is dependent upon the share price. And there's a horrible term used within the corporate world today, it, and it, it certainly doesn't mean what it says. The term is shareholder value. We have to create shareholder value which means, basically, we have to create the maximum amount of return for our shareholders regardless of business ethics. I mean, basically, anybody who does a degree today in business ethics is unemployable. <laughs> Completely and utterly unemployable. In fact, I've actually told people who have taken courses in business ethics never to mention it. Because it, it absolutely will define them as unemployable. <laughs> So this is the problem that you're up against. But there are an increasing number of people like John Perkins who have worked on the other side of the equation are not particularly happy with what they were doing, but it was what they were doing. But they've come full circle and now want to do something different. And there are a lot of people out in the oil industry who would be more than happy more than happy to give something back to their home country by being employed as consultants, advisors, or even frontline negotiators. 
in these projects. If you leave it to politicians, I'm sorry, but you're going to get screwed. As a country, that is. And the problem as well gets worse. Because if, <coughs> if the oil companies do not have the respect for the countries that they've negotiated with, then they don't show any respect when they're actually operating in those countries. Guess which country this is? This is Iraq. This is Iraq. <coughs> now, the reality, the reality is that post the invasion, the oil companies have gone in there and all concern for the environment has been blown out of the water. No one gives a damn because concern for the environment costs money. And because there's no, nobody in Iraq right now monitoring what's going on, there's nobody in the Iraqi government that's got sufficient clout to challenge the, uh, the oil companies. And of course the oil companies have their own private, private army anyway in, in the guise of Shea. Anybody here heard of Shea? No? No, but you've heard of Blackwalls, haven't you? Yeah. yeah. Yeah, well, just like Shell was getting a bit of a bad rap and changed its name to Topaz for its gas stations, Blackwalls was getting a bit of a bad rap after you know, a few civilians and children got in their crossfire. So they decided that they needed a makeover. So the makeover is so good, they've renamed themselves Shea. But don't waste your time going and Googling Shea. Not yet, anyway, not until I tell you how to spell it. Because, you know, you think Shea, S-H-A-Y, or thereabouts. They spelt it X-E. But don't go Googling X-E, because if you Google X-E, you will come up with a currency exchange website. You actually have to Google Blackwater stroke X-E. And then you can get into the latest updates and their own information. They've done it deliberately so that the casual researcher you know, doesn't uh, stumble across their activities. So, I mean, th this is a, an ecological disaster. I mean, by, by the way, another ecological disaster, of course, is the, um, is the Gulf of Mexico. And, um, you know, right now I'm BP's worst nightmare because ever since last July, I've been giving presentations because I have named the person that was put on the BP Deepwater Horizon to make that disaster happen. I've explained how it was done, why it was done. Now, if I'm wrong, of course, BP should be hauling me through the courts for libel or slander uh, and or, you know, doing whatever it takes to, um, to prove that I am incorrect. <coughs> but they won't. And even though that DVD has been available on Amazon since last September, BP actually somehow managed to persuade Amazon to hide it even from Amazon's own search engine. So up until a couple of weeks ago, even if you went into Amazon.co.uk and you Googled Ian Crane BP, you would find all my other stuff, but you wouldn't find the BP DVD. But a few phone calls, and uh, we've managed, at least for the time being, to, uh, to rectify that. Now, it took me it took me the best part of five weeks to trawl sufficient evidence to be completely confident of my assertion that it was a deliberately contrived event. Because I didn't want to believe, I didn't want to believe that my colleagues in the oil industry would perpetrate such an event. But, you know, I'm obviously very well aware of the pressures and the powers that can be brought to bear on some of these players. And I shouldn't really be surprised because one of the reasons, or the primary reason I'm doing what I do today, is because I was one of the first civilians to go into Iraq, uh, to Kuwait, rather, after the first Gulf War in 1991. Almost exactly 20 years ago. I was 34 years of age at the time. And at that time, I had absolutely no reason whatsoever to question orthodox reality. But when I went into Kuwait, and we were driving around the southern oil fields, it became very evident to me that the physical evidence did not support the official version of events. And the physical evidence was the young Iraqi conscripts still in their foxholes all around the wells in southern Kuwait with bullet holes in the backs of their necks. The fires in Kuwait in 1991 were set alight by US Special Forces. 
It took me five years, five years to integrate that experience. It took me another five years to corroborate the, uh, the evidence by uh, some correspondence with um, some former members of the US Special Forces who admitted they were part of the teams who set the world's light. And he said, well, why would they do that? Why on earth would they do that? Well, it's very simple, really. Primarily to demonize Saddam in the eyes of the rest of the world, easing the path for implementing sanctions on the country. But more importantly, it was so that the Emir of Kuwait would pay the American oil industry $7 billion to put them out. <laughs> Problem, reaction, solution. You know, and I mean, it was Hitler in Mein Kampf who said, the greater the crime perpetrated by the leadership, the less likelihood there is that the people will ever believe their leaders to be capable of perpetrating such an event. And of course, he wasn't particularly original because Machiavelli had said pretty much the same 500 years previously when he wrote The Prince, and Sun Tzu had said pretty much the same a couple of millennia before that when he wrote The Art of War. So when you have no respect for the people you're dealing with, this is what it ends up like. And in my opinion, in my opinion, one of the reasons that the Shell leadership appear to show total disregard <coughs> for the environment when they're operating up in Northwest Ireland is because they have no respect for the idiot who basically gave them carte blanche to rape the country's resources. And now, especially with what's going on in the world right now, of course, those resources are potentially increasing in value. Potentially, I say, because it's not quite straight, so straightforward. This is the price of oil. <coughs> you know, basically, just a little over a decade ago, the price of oil was barely $10 a barrel. Barely $10 a barrel. And then with the invasion of Iraq, the price ramped up and it peaked at $147 in July of uh, 2000, sorry, 2008. Yeah, $147. Right now, it dropped right down to 35 It dropped right back to $35 in uh, November of 2008. And basically it, it was ramping up to 75 And it was holding fairly steady at around about $75 until, of course, um, all hell broke loose in the, in the Middle East. So right now, price is uh, pushing 100, and it's probably going to push um, above that. So you multiply the resources by two, because most of the estimates that I've seen on the value of the resources were calculated last January, January 2010, and you know, we're well on the way to the price uh, being doubled. Now, here's the proof that basically the Celtic Tiger and every other supposed tiger around the world was just smoke and mirrors because this is the price of gold over 10 years. Here's the price of gold 10 years ago, a little over $250 an ounce. The price of gold right now is a little over $1,400 an ounce. Okay? The price of gold is the true reflection of purchasing power. In other words, one gold coin effectively always holds its purchasing power. You know, back in the 1940s, it was said that one gold coin, a sovereign, will buy you a reasonable quality suit. Today, one gold coin, a sovereign, which is worth about 200 and, just a, 200 and a few plus euros, will buy you a reasonable quality suit. You need exactly the same amount of gold coins today to buy a house as you would have needed in 1953.